There's another very glad announcement we're making this morning, and that is we are welcoming our new principal organist, Rodney Gervin, to our bench this morning. <laughs> Playing the Navy hymn, I know has half of you in his hand already. We're taking a trip. It's the summer months. We're on a missionary journey with Paul. It's his second. And he begins the second missionary journey in Antioch. His home goes to Tarsus, his hometown, through these places of the first missionary journey. And then this long time where there's no stops, a lot of traveling, but the Spirit has not permitted Paul to preach there. From Troas, they've sailed to Philippi, and they've landed in the continent of Europe. They don't know that, but we know that. God knows that, and the gospel has taken a new direction. There in Philippi, we've heard the stories of the Philippian jailer, and we've heard the stories of Lydia, and now we have come to Thessalonica. Now, Paul has traveled overland, but let me show you how I and about 25 other members of the congregation traveled last fall in Paul's footsteps. Now, the tour is called the Footsteps of Paul, but <clears throat> we, we were on a cruise ship. And we were told this was the very one Paul was on. I'm sure I sat in the dining room right where he sat. Mostly we were on a bus going from Philippi to Thessalonica and Berea and places like that, and it may not be evident, but we were happy. This is Thessalonica. You can see it from uh, the hill. It uh, comes in the bay. It's flat only for a ways, the old part of the city. But all the new parts of the city are up, going up mountains, and we'll see that in just a moment. But that's the bay, and Paul would have come there. Everywhere that Paul and Silas is, we can go to the next one. Everywhere that Paul and Silas is, there is now a church. In Greece, it's an Orthodox church, and they are very glad to tell you about their ancient origins when the apostles came right here to their town, and the gospel began. These are the hills behind Thessalonica. Paul would have traveled these with Silas and Timothy and Luke when they left Thessalonia in kind of a hurry and then had to go to Berea. The path route that they would have taken is called Via Ignatia. The top line is the Greek Ignatia Odos. We get our word, word odometer from it. And on the bottom, the Latin Via Ignatia. This is the primary road from Rome east to ancient Byzantium, now modern Istanbul goes through all of Italy, crosses the Adriatic, and then through all of Greece and Macedonia to Asia. They would have traveled this very road. This is what the road looks like today. It's a footpath as it goes over a stream and a gorge near those mountains by Thessalonica. And one more, this is the road coming up out of Thessalonica. You can see the bay in the distance in the ancient parts of the city. Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke would have walked on these very stones. Very cool. The cruise ship was more fun. Let's pray. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The passage is Acts chapter 17, the first nine verses. It tells the story of Paul and his team in the city of Thessalonica. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and Rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. 
They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. This is the word of the Lord. Well, the gospel is prominent in this passage and in all. The Jews, Paul and Silas, Silas probably senior to Paul, Timothy, the young man, Luke, the Greek, whose hometown was not far from here, are now traveling from Philippi to Thessalonica, walking the Via Ignatia. This road is the main west-east road connecting Rome to Byzantium, modern Istanbul. They make two stops along the way, overnight, no doubt, Amphipolis and Apollonia, thus breaking the trip into about three equal 30-mile days. Those are long days on foot. When they arrived at Thessalonica, they are pleased to find a synagogue. There had not been one in Philippi where they had just left, thus the meeting with the women at prayers at the river outside of town in Philippi. But with an active synagogue, Paul can return to his usual pattern of preaching the gospel, attending Sabbath services, and during the open discussions debating the meaning of any particular scripture passage, Paul would tell them about Jesus, explaining that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. That's news to them. And this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is that Messiah. Some Jews believed. Some God-fearing Greeks believed. Many, says Luke. Quite a few prominent women believed. Then the story begins. Some were jealous of Paul and Silas. Others of bad character were rounded up in the marketplace, formed into a mob, and goaded into beginning a riot. Then they went to the house of Jason. And thus the theme that strikes us so much in the stories in Philippi is again central to this story, hospitality. Now remember Lydia, an immigrant herself with some wealth, a merchant woman, upon conversion immediately assists that Paul and his friends, she pleaded with them, says the scripture, would stay in her home. This is the first follow through on the come follow me of the call of Christ in Europe hospitality. The jailer later in the same story and in the same city, perhaps ironically, houses Paul and Silas in the prison dungeon of his own home. He must arrange for their food, but doesn't say that he did that. He must take care of their wounds so they don't die from them, but doesn't say he did that. Maybe Lydia was doing all that. But yet after his conversion in the jailhouse, in his own dungeon, we hear first that this jailer tends to the wounds of Paul and Silas, and then provides a meal for them with his family in the full home. And later, at last in the story, when the authorities went to quietly escort Paul and Silas out of town, they know that they've done wrong, the authorities. Paul has the authorities visit with them in Lydia's home. Now, this is the first home of faith in Europe. The internal courtyard of Lydia is the first church on the continent. Now again, or perhaps I should say already, the story presumes hospitality. Every story from here on out will presume hospitality. We don't need to call attention to it so much. When the angry mob wanted to grab Paul and Silas, they knew where to go, to the house of Jason. Jason, no doubt, like Lydia and the Philippian jailer, was a recent convert and had opened his home in an act of hospitality. The city knew it. This act of hospitality had quickly and surely identified Jason with his guests. That the crowd, now wanting to lay hands on Paul and Silas, not finding them there, took Jason and other believers who were there as sufficient collateral. That's the way it always is. Host and guest living together are now identified together. We bring the homeless into our home here on the campus of First Presbyterian Church downtown. The neighborhood, the city, identifies us with the homeless. And we are glad for that. We bring into worship and discipleship training those whose lives are being rescued at the mission next door to us. We are being identified with the down, but not out. And we are glad for that identification. When we engage in acts of hospitality, especially as a whole church and on our campus, 
We are identifying ourselves for the whole city to see with those with whom Jesus most identified. When you help such as these, said the Savior, you help me. In Philippi, it's Lydia in the Philippian jailer. In Thessalonica, it's Jason. Now Jason will pay a price for his obedience and his love. He and others with him are dragged out before the city officials, falsely accused of starting a riot and, what is very much more, accused of rebellion against Caesar. They will need to post bond for themselves and their guests. Last week I told you why these stories of Philippi and Thessalonica are so precious to our family. At least I told you the first two reasons. My grandson is named Silas after this Silas of these stories and because of these stories. He has a birth condition called spina bifida that, among other things, leaves him paralyzed from the waist down. Silas is six now and thriving and happy. The first reason my daughter named my grandson Silas was that though his feet are bound like Silas in prison with Paul, like Silas and like Paul in prison, this Silas will also sing praise to God. And when the boy stands, he'll stand for justice, like Paul and Silas had stood for justice in Philippi. Now the third reason comes from the city of Thessalonica. The hospitality and aid, the protector, the person who took them in and posted bond for them and helped them along the way, the person most connected with Silas and Thessalonica is Jason. And Jason is the name of our son, who also has this birth condition of spina bifida with a paralysis from the waist down. Uncle Jason, nephew Silas, identified together. Last week we were in Philippi. That's a Roman colony, and that's important to the story. Use italicum. It's a special right given to a city to be thought of as thoroughly Italian though not in Italy. Truly Roman. Roman rule and only Roman rule. Roman way of life only. That's important to the story in this city. A spirit possesses a girl, requiring her to tell the future. Men own the girl, she is a slave, and profit from her abilities. Paul drives out the spirit. Frankly, the spirit goes rather peacefully. The men do not. To make money off of her, they persuade the crowd and the city authorities of the threat to their, as they say it, Roman way of life. Read slavery and exploitation of the vulnerable. The city authorities align with the economic interests, and in this case, the economic interests are aligned with evil. At the story's end, Paul and Silas will give a lesson in justice to the city and to the authorities. Now we're in Thessalonica. It is not a Roman city. It's in the Roman Empire, but it is a Greek city and a very proud Greek city to be Greek. Today, it's the second largest city in the nation of Greece with a huge university and a great and long political tradition. Just ask them about it. They'll be glad to brag about it. Then it was the bearer of a truly Greek way of civic life, an ancient way. But given the right, rare right of self-government, they can call it the way they see it in the city of Thessalonica under imperial rule. They decide ancient Greek forms. Now the vocabulary of this passage is technical, politically accurate, and politically charged. We are getting a lesson in the political dynamics of a Greek city. The city officials here translate as such, the Greek word is deem. We get our word democracy from it. It's the one city council where the powers of the people are invested in these elected officials. In ancient Athens, where this tradition first began, there were 500 such people at any given time and rotated arbitrarily by lot through the full citizenship of the city. They had legislative powers. They debated and made the laws and posted them. They had executive powers. They appointed the magistrates. The magistrates all answered to them. And in the heyday of Greek ascendancy, when they were the empires, they appointed the generals and requisitioned the military. And they are the judicial branch. That's what's important in this story. They are the only judge and jury in the city. 
These are ancient political values and institutions being exercised in the first century Roman Empire. Now, the accusation against Paul and Silas is twofold and entirely political. The first, they've disturbed the order of the city. Order, decorum, settled beliefs and practices, uninterrupted, that's the way it's supposed to be, don't you know? They caused trouble all over the world. Well, that's a trumped up charge. They've really only been to Philippi so far. Though there, there had been issues of economic justice. There had been an imprisonment and an escort out of town. The phrase is, they shook up the world. It's the same way that any ancient Greek would describe an earthquake, the shaking up of the world. Well, actually, there had been an earthquake in Philippi when God releases the prisoners from the dungeon. God had done that. So maybe on this part, you can sympathize with them just a little and just for a moment, but only a moment. If people came to our town who are usually accompanied by earthquakes, wouldn't you consider offering them an escort out of town? I say send them to L.A. That was mean. There is an unsettling with the gospel. Ideas and practices and people change radically. This can be unsettling to family members, to neighbors, to civic authorities. What's at issue here is protection of order. And at its worst, and often enough it's at its worst, it means protection of privilege. Slavers of a spirit-possessed girl in Philippi want order protected. Their order. Their privilege. The political leaders of Thessalonica want order protected. Their order their privilege. Caesar, too, it is clear, fears disorder, threatens his privilege. Less than 10 years earlier, we're in the year 50 AD, in the year 41 AD, Claudius, the Roman Caesar, had, after a riot, warned in a letter to the Jews in Alexandria about some Jews who were, and I quote, fomenters of a general plague infecting the whole world at the instigation of someone called Christus, Christ. This is the borrowed language now of the accusers of Paul and Silas in Thessalonica, hiding their own insecurities in Caesar's. Just one year earlier than this, 49 AD, because of rioting, the same Claudius had banished all Jews from Rome. Accusations against the apostles and those newly following them, therefore, are ready-made they're just right there for the taking. All one needed to do was fill in the blank. Paul and Silas. Can't find them? Jason and his friends. Note Caesar and his decrees are now invoked. This becomes the second charge, very much a part of the first. The second more serious charge is they defy Caesar's decrees saying there is another king one called Jesus. You betcha. That's the gospel. Saul had feared David, Herod, the infant Jesus, Pilate, the Savior standing before him. Every Caesar, it seems, fears almost everyone else. And for good reason. Plots and coups and assassinations and violence account for transfer of power as much as in more so than in the Roman Empire as by peaceful means. To read ancient Roman historians on their own imperial Roman history is to learn the Latin words for poison, stabbing, strangulation. Caesar had decreed that no one may speak of succession. That is, no one in the empire under any circumstances may even mention that one day, someday, there'll be another Caesar. No one, simply put, may ever speak of another king. Paul and Silas, they speak about almost nothing else than another king. This is the gospel they preach, as Luke records for us in the passage. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Yes, Jesus is a replacement strategy. 
Jesus is God's replacement strategy for every little man who enslaves every smaller girl, every tyrant who rules ruthlessly, every insecure civic authority who aligns with evil economic practices, and every Caesar who decrees a silence lest anyone subject to him suggests that he is not immortal and that he will not reign forever. Paul and Silas will declare one king, the righteous one who makes everything crooked straight, whose person is holy, whose ways are just, who frees the enslaved girl from evil spirits and evil men, who sets the apostle free from jails and shackles, who converts the merchant and jailer, women and men, who is God's king and Messiah for all the people. Somewhere in there, you can hear Paul's tone of voice. So, take that, Caesar. To change gods is to change economic practices. To change gods is to change political practices. The specific charges in this case are trumped up, but they are not altogether false. The big men in the marketplace and the emperor on the throne are right to have fear and feel threatened. Their time is coming to an end. The proclamation of the gospel, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, is an announcement of regime change. The gospel temporizes all existing authorities. The gospel limits all reigning powers. Democracies included. Greek democracies, for all their beauty, and there is much, I admire it, for all their wisdom, it is astounding how early these grand ideas began and were sustained against odds. And for all their inspiration for freedom in the centuries to come, forming our country in particular with their ideas and institutions, are included in the indictment. The most famous Greek jury, the first deem, that is the first democracy, 500 men sitting in jury in Athens 500 years before this, had infamously accused, convicted, and executed Socrates. The charges? Disturbing the order of the city, not believing in the gods the city believes in. It sounds like Philippi and Thessalonica to me. What does it sound like today? Quite sadly, in Kenya, this week was a witness. International Justice Mission is a mission with which our congregation has long been associated. A member of our congregation, too, indeed, have worked with him in countries around the world against sex trafficking of minors, the grabbing of land of widows, forced labor of children, false imprisonment, and abuse of police power. International Justice Attorney Willie Kamini, a Christian pursuing justice for the poor in Kenya. His client, Joseph Faf Winda, a man brutalized by the police, but who, because Willie came alongside him, would have his day in court. Together with their trusted driver, Joseph Murari, the three men left court last Thursday, June 23, and headed home. They never arrived. It's Friday morning, two days ago. The bodies of the three men were found in the old Danu Sabuk River of northeast Nairobi. Someone wanted to preserve their privilege in the order of things. Someone did not want to answer to a higher king. IJM now asks us to join the people of Kenya, who are so accustomed to the abuse of police power, and petitioning the president of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, to investigate and to bring to justice the murderers and to remove from office the deputy inspector general of the administration of police. The call to sign the petition went out this morning, and as of now, there are 7,500 signatures. One of them is mine. Because those who preach the gospel 
know that the order of things, Caesar and civic officials included, are challenged by the announcement that Jesus is God's king. This king has his own holiness and his own justice. This is the gospel. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is Messiah. Ready to proclaim it? Let us pray. When the gospel first came to our hearts, it turned us around. And we are learning, O oh Lord, that when your gospel goes to the world, it turns it upside down. Give us whatever courage we lack, whatever wisdom we do not yet have, and whatever grace we still need, that we may follow this gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.